How's it going, everybody? Welcome back to the Blue Shifting, and welcome back to... Well, last time was... Traumatic would be the word I would use. Um, it's... I, I, it's not unusual for me to express emotions, but to be full out crying, that's that's unusual for the show. So I'm glad that I, that I was able to kind of have a shared vulnerability. It's hard. I mean, someone pointed out in the comments that this part of the story, if you've ever had a pet that you've loved and lost, like it hits really hard. That's happened to me before. Uh, the story was also really good. I'm just so involved and I and get so immersed into everything, so it makes a ton of sense. But yeah, we're gonna jump right in. So we're glad to meet you here. We had a very, very interesting, um, like intimate moment that I had to cut most of because I'm in the uncensored version. But uh, it was interesting hearing some of the dynamic and back and forth and some of your thoughts. Because again, I have in the past been a bit like kind of dismissive or or even disgruntled by uh, some of the H scenes in previous games. And this one I was actually had a very positive interaction with and some of that and some of you were surprised and I, again It all comes down to narrative like I have no issue with having a true fan service in a game I think it actually can be an enhancement. I can see how it can become a draw for some audience members, but ultimately My problem is that when the H scenes become the reason or like the motivation Almost like like the whole game is just centered around getting to those scenes. I, I don't like that I like when the scenes are part of a narrative that makes sense. It's part of a, a a story and a moment and interaction for two characters who are, you know, having a relationship. I feel like it makes it feel more real and enhances. And of course, yes, there's a little bit of extra fluff that's added to it to make it more digestible, maybe you could say. Um, and some people can still get bothered by that. And like in some ways it is, but I felt like at least for Michiru's scene, it was actually really rather tame and tasteful in a way. Like it's hard to explain it in that regard, but like you have to experience it for yourself. And then, you know, let me know what you thought. But for me, it didn't feel gratuitous. It didn't feel like just like forced in there in any way. It just felt more of like kind of an extension of the story and narrative of where we were and what Michiru was going through and like the kind of what she needed and whether you agree or disagree, especially on the morality side of it, I know people can be very dis divisive on that, but ultimately it was part of the story and it was part of the character arc and part of their decision making. And so it was really, I thought it was ultimately very sweet and I felt like the execution of it was actually pretty tasteful. So yeah, we're going to go to that. But now that we've had that moment and kind of like this bond, now we've kind of uh, he's seen Yuji, he's confronted uh, Michiru and said like, hey, I need to know what's going on here. I need to know. It's time you talk to us about it. And Michidu seems like she's ready to talk. And so now let's sit down. We've kind of had some time to digest all the trauma and craziness that happened last episode. So now maybe we'll finally get some answers and figure out what's actually going on. So let's jump right in. I lower my paper back to the floor, shifting my attention to Michidu's story. Yeah, dark Michidu and light Michidu. There's another me inside me. I'm not playing with words or anything. It's really like a completely different person. My body doesn't belong to me alone. That really scares me, but it's thanks to her that I'm even alive today. She knows everything about me, but I know nothing about her. In that case, in that, in that case which of us has the better claim to being the real me? I'm not sure, actually. That's a decent question. I was born into a relatively wealthy family. My parents valued me highly, and all the more so because I was their only child. They provided me with an excellent education, hoping to raise me into a worthy daughter, one they could show off with pride. I mean, quintessential, like, like the Japanese, and I also call it the American parent dream, being able to, like, feel like you're shining as a beacon, and that your child just becomes yet another example of just the gloriousness that is your good decision making. Although I was still a child, no, maybe it's because I was still a child. They bought countless tutors for our home to pack knowledge into my head like travelers suffering all their luggage into one tiny overburdened suitcase. The tutors were all excellent in their fields and they all charged heavily for their lessons. After studying with them, even the most uncooperative and dim-witted children could be safely sent off into the world. But I guess I was sort of a special case. It took a lot of time and trouble for me to learn the simplest of things. When showed a perfectly clear example, they told me, now you try, please. I couldn't even imitate my, Im imitate my tutors properly. This is actually really interesting. I think there's a, like, um, 
Majority of people have a very clear capacity for learning, but I feel like we can often overlook the fact that not all of us learn the same. Now, granted, this manifests in a lot of different ways, and a lot of us can probably relate to that statement, but there are also cases where you get this really interesting dichotomy where you'll have some children who genuinely just suffer in school. Like They just do not test well, they do not follow in class very well, they have trouble, especially with maybe particular subjects, but then they'll shine in other ways. Sometimes it's in applied mechanics and stuff, like being able to really just manipulate things in the world rather than all the theoretical stuff that works on pen and paper. Sometimes it's about understanding numbers and things that are very consistent versus language, which can be very inconsistent. Sometimes it's just simply people struggle to learn in, in like, like standard ways. It's not quite so simple as being able to say like, oh, these are normal students and these are special students. It's like there are plenty of st people who are genuinely brilliant, but they just don't, you know, fit or interact with the standards like uh, education models. And that's not to say that education itself is terribly flawed. I, I would actually argue that as flawed as education is, the biggest flaws tend to be in, you know, execution and like losing like the the needs of the individual in the sea of like the, the greater need of the class. And I but I think ultimately like education works for the majority of people as it is. And we're so lucky that we have easy access to education. You realize how much of our history most people never even got a chance to learn some of the basics. Like the fact that majority of people in like many nations are getting access to just fundamental basic educations, being able to understand fundamental sciences and maths and being able to get a, a broader understanding of history of the world. And while yes, those things can be, you know, colorized or or you know tuned to specific cultures and specific histories and narratives ultimately the fact that we all have access to this stuff comparatively to ans our ancestors is a great thing <clears throat> we should be very very grateful for this despite its flaws we should always seek to improve it but education is so important and i think michu is falling into one of these cases where i'm guessing that she doesn't learn traditionally she might have better ways of learning and growing and expanding her horizons but not through traditional methods, but her parents look like they're, they're bombarding her with this, like hoping that if they just throw enough money at the problem and enough people at the problem, that specialists, it will get through eventually. <coughs> Excuse me. I understood what I needed to do, but when I tried to put that knowledge into practice, my voice would quake and my throat would go dry, even though I wasn't being threatened in any way, tears would come to my eyes. It's very common for a lot of kids. They just, it's the pressure. Piano and violin, arithmetic and English alphabet. It was all the same, no matter what subject. When I hesitated, my tutors would say, you didn't understand? I'll do it one more time and repeat the example faster than before. And then they would glare at me with eyes that said, get it right already. That really, really scared me. My body would freeze up entirely. My clothes would grow damp with sweat. By the time my molars began to chatter against each other, I could no longer muster the strength to even try. The tutor would scowl down at me, looking ready to burst into angry shouting at any moment. Too heavy to, uh, the heavier their gazes weighed on me, the less I could move or think. Time crawled past in empty silence. In the end, the tutor would simply sigh in exasperation and leave the room. It wasn't uncommon for my lessons to end with nothing more than that. Dejected and humiliated, I could only reflect on my uselessness. And as I stood in my quiet room, stock still and alone, eventually I would hear an angry voice from outside. Mm. This is also a flaw of uh, parents who are so focused on like their child succeeding that they tend to blame teachers and environments and friends for being the reason their child isn't succeeding in the way that they perceive success. Um, and it's actually a much more modern problem where we, it's, it's not fair to blame children for weaknesses because we all have weaknesses and children especially are just trying to comprehend the world they don't even have the ability to properly pro understand and process their own thoughts. So we shouldn't be sitting there and getting angry at a child for not learning in the exact way we expect. But we also can't look at a teacher and play saying that they're the incompetent ones because their child isn't learning in a traditional way. Again and again, violent words rattled against my window, window pane like fat drops of icy rain. I would cover my ears and wait for the storm to pass. It tended to go on for quite some time. When the shouting finally ended and silence returned, my father would come to my room and push open the door. Michiru, 
先生に遠慮することはないんだぞお前はパパとママの子だやればできるんだからね That's what sucks It's like this is painting a clear picture that her parents genuinely loved her and just wanted her to be really successful They wanted the best for her but It seems that they might be blind to some of the things, the realities of life. And that blinding is kind of misdirecting their anger, which is interesting because it's like, oh, yeah, like, oh, you're a rich kid who didn't, who got nervous around teaching. Like, what's your, what, like, why is your life so hard? It's like, well, no, like, just because she doesn't have the same traditional struggles that a lot of people, including myself, had to face growing up, doesn't mean that these aren't very real things, especially to a child. She's terrified of the yelling. She's terrified of the verbal violence. And that scares her almost as much as the teaching, I'm guessing. In fact, it might make it worse because she's so scared that more yelling, more fighting, more like insults and stress will be dumped on the people around her. So I, I actually think Michidu is just incredibly empathetic because I can see, again, similarities between her and myself and that empathy. It's almost like it almost hurts more for someone near you whom you know to get yelled at than for you to get yelled at. Because for some reason, it feels worse when it's something happening to somebody else. And so, yeah, her dad's not yelling at her, he's yelling at her tutors, but it hurts her almost as if she's yelling. And in fact, I'm guessing it's going to compound where she's going to get really stressed out because as she starts to, as she struggles and fails, she's going to panic. Feeling like, oh no, dad's gonna start yelling at this guy again. And that's gonna make her even more panicked and it's gonna make her stress even more, which makes her even worse at her studies. It's gonna be a self feeding circle. That's the other thing, too, is like, as much as it sucks, <clears throat> you don't ever want to squash the potential of your child. But、uh, we also need to be good and be able to recognize and real realize that like, sometimes there's things that are just beyond your grasp. Like, it sucks, but it's something I've had to learn too. It's that it's not enough to just want to do something or to desire to achieve something. Like, you can do a lot if you put your mind to it, and you don't need to have like, natural talent. That's kind of a lie anyway, but like, you can do a lot. But I also think it's important to have a healthy understanding that like, we can't all do everything. There are things that will be beyond our grasp for whatever reason. Unfair as they are, there are things that we are just not going to be capable of. That means every person's journey needs to be unique and different. And we aren't all going to fit into a mold that our parents think are good or that we think are good for you know, our children or our friends or our, like, our partners and relationships. Oh, oh, Aww, cute, young me to do very cute sounding. よし、できるな。そうだ、欲しいものはあるか。何でも買ってやるぞ。Dang. Can you imagine being a kid and being told, like, oh, you want anything? I'll buy it for you. My dad was nice to me. It was hard to believe he was the same person who'd been shouting at the teacher just a few minutes ago. When he held me against his,、uh, against his board, a broad, powerful chest, I smiled cigarettes and women's perfume. Never the same brand twice. It was comfortable, but also a little scary. I've got to do better next time. I can't let daddy and mommy down. That night I knelt by the window, joined by my small hands together, and prayed to the stars. Interesting. Okay, so, like, this isn't the first time she's made a reference to religion. And it's interesting. So, is she just praying at the stars, or is she supposed to be, like, actually religious? It's hard to know. With a lot of Japanese media, it also feels like、uh, religion is kind of more of a source of creative.、Um, Expression rather than actual religiousness. Like, there's a lot of Christian, Christian like iconography and even references and a lot of the anime and stuff. But、uh, most often than not, it seems like it's more of an aesthetic thing rather than an actual faith thing. So, I wonder what approach they took here. <laughs> Like, here's like she's praying. Like, so is this supposed to be the prayer to like a Christ, the Christian God, like the one God, or is it more of a general, like, to the God who is listening, which is very much more of the kind of like something that would be considered a lot more in line with the traditional Japanese viewpoint, the idea of like the, the gods of like the world and the universe and nature, but you know. That kind of thing. Again, I, I have a very surface level understanding of that. I want to learn more, but I also don't want to just claim that, oh, I read Wikipedia pages or something and know what I'm talking about. It's like, I, I have no idea. 
I, I definitely want to go to Japan, though. I want to go and visit, like, some of the Shinto shrines. And, like, I'm going to be there because I want to understand some of the dogmatism and, like, the ideologies and everything there. Not just to be like, oh, pretty arches. It's like, I want to, like, see and experience and understand the spiritual side to Japan. The next day was my regular music lesson. I sat perched quietly in front of a piano that had been shipped overseas from Hamburg, waiting for the teacher to arrive. In that moment, if somebody had snuck up and hit the keyboard, I might have tumbled right off the bench. My anxiety and fear must have shown on my face. When my tutor finally arrived, she closed the door carefully behind her and immediately came to my side. Oh boy, ain't that fun! Oh no! She spoke in a very gentle voice, so for a moment the sentence didn't really register, but all too soon I realized that she had spoken awful, terrifying words. Dang, man. Can you imagine that? I wonder if this is based on a real experience that somebody had, like the writer or somebody who the writer knew. Because this is awful. The tutor struck me with a thin, stiff rod. The stinging pain of the blow lingered like a nasty paper cut. Oh man. And she's not going to tell her dad about this because she's worried he'll be upset again. Dang. Yeah, so... They, they're taking it out on her. Didn't want to say it. Even a child could understand how cruel those words were, but I was so terrified of being struck again that I squeezed them out anyway. Yeah, that's so It's like, this is very like, oh gosh, what's your name? From um, Batilda, it's like Miss Churnbuckle or something. Like, I'm big, you're small, I'm smart, you're dumb, uh, I'm right, you're wrong, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's like, it's the same I, if idea as this, this like, feel like the, the feelings of shame, frustration, and competence coming out and being like, dumped on a child because the child can't fight back because the child can't say anything because the child is seen as powerless and it's like this is like it's abuse it's it's flat out abuse and like it's one thing to like we can def we can disagree or agree on things like discipline the role of discipline in growing up and what discipline can take i think there's a lot of there's a lot of discourse there i'm not going to get into but this isn't that this isn't discipline this is revenge this is petty like power play this is um personal venting like this this teacher and this tutor felt shame and frustration and disgruntled at the yelling of her father and is taking out on her because they feel like they can get away with it <clears throat> which means i'm guessing that michiru isn't the first to get this kind of treatment so that's terrifying because I guess a kid's gonna take that literally too. I don't think she could have been serious, but my entire body shrunk in fear. I was so terrified I couldn't answer, and since I didn't respond, she hit me again. God, that sucks. I had numerous tutors, but after that day, it wasn't long before every one of them began to discipline me in the same way. The female tutor might have told the others that I wouldn't tattle on my parents no matter what they did to me. Their discipline grew more refined with time, developing into a kind of art. They found ways to cause me pain without leaving telltale marks behind. Skillfully and thoroughly, they broke me in mind and body. Disgusting. It became impossible for me to look people in the eyes when I spoke. I was never good at holding lengthy conversations, but my responses grew shorter with each passing day, and by the end I was barely speaking at all. 
Even though my suffering might have been slightly meaningful in those Spartan lessons that produced results, but no matter how hard I tried to please my tormentors, I never improved my evaluations. My father dismissed the tutors in ones and twos over terrible results until none remained. They cursed me to my face before they went. Some even spat on the floor of my room before stalking out. Finally, he figured out something, but then she's not going to say it. See, like, that's the thing. What sucks is that it sounds like he genuinely was a good guy. Like, he might have, um, like, executed his own, like, will improperly and it led to some bad choices. But the thing is, like, I don't think the father is a terrible person in any way. He genuinely seems like he cared and just wanted the best for his child, like any parent would. Uh, but because he was probably really used to delegating and throwing money at problems... That delegation and then his like very cruel like like exertion of his expectations led to those other terrible people to make terrible choices that ended up hurting Michiru. And she never felt comfortable or able capable expressing that fear and that hurt and that and what happened because as a child you tend to just believe what, what adults say. And like she said earlier, she's like she couldn't have actually meant it, but she was so terrified she wasn't going to like. She was going to comply. That sucks. <sighs> but I was unable to fulfill even that modest hope. On my walks around the garden, I would sometimes find myself painfully sort of breath, clutching my throbbing chest. My parents grew concerned. Eventually, they brought me to a big hospital for an examination. And there, I was diagnosed with a serious heart disease. The doctor's verdict? Continuing to lead a normal life outside the hospital would necessitate significant restrictions on my activities. From now on, I'd have to refrain from vigorous exercise. It's actually funny because, like, it sounds like the same condition from the Katawa Sojo novelization, and it's and, you, and it's interesting because, like, it's a rare condition. But ironically, I actually have a personal friend who had a very similar condition. Um, I've had two actually with heart conditions. One that had like like a de the the heart the heart defect that had to be repaired when they were young, and they were able to do normal things, but they had to go in for regular checkups. And then another friend who has had has like a significant like a kind of a cap where they have to be very careful not to get their heart rate above a certain point or else it could be like their their heart could like just explode. Um, and so they like are trying to live like a functional adult life, but they have this constant like doom sort of Damocles hanging over their head where the wrong wrong move, one wrong like outburst, one wrong like rush of emotions can lead to just a sudden death. And it's just a constant fear of their lives. See, that's so this is very similar to what my friend experiences. Like I said, like live a normal life, just try not to push yourself. You go too far, could be the end. I couldn't study or play the piano. I was never much of an athlete. Even talking with people was a struggle, and now I'd become an invalid who couldn't even live a normal life. As I watched my parents' faces fill with disappointment, a thought occurred to me. Oh, look at that. My tutors were right all along. See, that's the the really poisonous thing there. Like their parent the parents were filled with disappointment, but they weren't filled with disappointment that you they were disappointed that you weren't going to be able to live the life they hoped you would have. But I can see like a child could easily just like make that misassociation and then especially when she was primed with so much terrible self like value from those conversations with those tutors. Now, this is, like, so... It's so real. It's kind of scary. Like I said, I feel like this is based on actual experiences by the writer or at least someone close to the writer in their life because, like, the deterioration of self through, like, small but very real abuses is so tangible here. They told me I was a stupid, useless person who didn't even deserve to live, and they weren't wrong. They were! They must have said it a hundred times. Why didn't I figure it out earlier? Of course they beat me. It's only natural to treat garbage like garbage. And it's so that's sad that like it's validating, even though it's like literally out of her own control. Like there's nothing she could have done to avoid this. This was just a, a, a bad hand that life dealt her. And yet now she's making it sound like it's her fault because that's how it feels to people. Thinking that was that made me feel a little better. 
I was stupid to even try to answer my parents' expectations. I wasn't cut out for that from the start. The thought freed me from my burdens, also wiped away the meaning of my existence. Soon, my parents had lost all hope in me and devoted their nights to producing a new child. Their previously frequent visits to my room grew rare, and the time I spent alone increased. My room was always cold. Kept the curtains shut throughout the day. Little by little, I felt myself slipping away from the world outside. Nothing I did turned out right. But of course it didn't. I was defective from the start. Clumsy and awkward as I was, I soon found the one and only thing I was good at. Letting time roll past in empty, uneventful silence. Oh, that's a depressing thought. I would sit quietly in the corner of my room, not budging a millimeter all day, simply drawing breath. That alone became something of a specialty of mine. Even a mollusk at the bottom of the sea probably couldn't beat me at staying still. That was all I had left to be proud of. I continued to live like a clam, but biologically speaking, I'm a human being. My body grew larger little by little, and in time I stopped being a child. I was no longer allowed to shut myself up in my room doing nothing. I had to go to a place called school. The little mermaid who lived at the bottom of the sea couldn't speak the human tongue very well, but by the same token, I couldn't really communicate with the other students. It didn't help that I was a clam, not, be not a beautiful princess. Everyone around me could live a normal life. I envied them from the bottom of my heart. I couldn't study or make friends. Moving around a little would get my heart screaming with pain. Just keeping myself breathing was about all I could manage. At first, a number of my classmates made an effort to draw me out of my solitude. But I didn't know what to say to them. Most of the time, I just nodded my head and mumbled, yeah, with stiff expression on my face. And the problem is that once you get that established, like, oh, they don't want to be bothered, like, they don't want to talk to us, it then becomes cemented, and then people stop trying. I inevitably, the people who approached me gradually gave up, and eventually the class came to operate as if I wasn't there. That was kind of a relief in a way. Nobody expects anything from me, so I couldn't disappoint anyone. It was as though I was made of air. Even in school, I could return to my life as a clam. I thought that was just fine. Not bad at all. My parents made sure I went to a school regularly, probably think I'd at least have to communicate with other people there, but it wasn't rare for me to go an entire day without speaking a single word. Even when the teacher took attendance, they'd just glance in my direction, not bothering to call my name. As, if, as my free time increased, I began to think pretty regularly about the point of my own existence, or rather, the pointlessness. Why was I going to school? Why was I even alive? I considered those questions at some length. It, again, when I was in my, like, my blank year, my year of, like, I, where I don't have any real memories or recollection, I don't know if I did the, the why am I around or what was the, point, the pointlessness of existence. I think I was a bit below that, even. I don't think I, I, I wasn't... What, I wasn't thinking about whether or not I, there was a point to existence. I kind of was just focusing on existing. It wasn't about, like, motivation. And I definitely wasn't, like... Like, I wasn't leaning in any type of self-harm direction. Like, that was never a direction I took it. I just was more of, like, just see the next sunrise. And then you see the next sunrise. And it's like, alright, now let's get to the next one. That was all it was for me. Watching from afar as my classmates laughed together, chatted enthusiastically about television, sometimes I would have to fight down the urge to burst into tears. They were so close, but I was separated by the, from them by an insurmountable wall. Even a trash can is useful to others, I was just taking up space. Why was I born in the first place? My parents had given me a cell phone, saying I'd probably need it as a student. There wasn't a single message or call recorded in the history log, and the memory was clean, pure white. That phone must have been lighter than anyone else's. It was empty inside. Unless I kept a firm grip on it, I'd probably float up in the air and get pecked at by passing birds and disappear with a pop. In the end, that was my only conclusion. A year passed in that school, then two, and that was my only constant rock of truth. On the deserted rooftop of the school building, I looked up at the blue sky and stretched out all, uh, over, the road to, uh, over the road to school. I longed for death. Uh, simply didn't understand the point of continuing to breathe. Literally every day it was non-entity or something like walking on an icy road and bare feet. First it's scary, but soon enough your nerves are paralyzed. You feel nothing at all. A good while later, when you realize this might be pretty bad, it's already far too late. There's nowhere to go from here. There's nothing to be done. You live every day of your life frozen to the ground, choking on bitter cold air. That's a weird load-in thing there. Did I miss something? 
Hang on. Okay, nope, never mind. With that thought in mind, it began to heat up the roof during every recess period. Up there, the only thing separating this world from the next was a waist-high steel fence. Someday, I'll cross over that fence and become free. Someday, I'll escape into nothingness. Comforted by those thoughts, I waited patiently for the right timing. That's the scary thing, too. For people who are preoccupied with these uh, these types of thoughts, it's not like a sp turn of the sp like spur of the moment type thing, usually. It can be. But usually it's something that's on the mind for a while and it's slowly something you're trying to like work your way up to. And that's why they say like, listen to your friends, pay attention to their mannerisms, look for signs because there is like a wind up to it essentially. And almost, almost like a subconscious like call for help in a way where they're waiting to see if anyone will notice that they're having these thoughts, which is not really fair because we can't read minds. But that's why it's always good to be a little vigilant, especially if you if you have in the back of your mind like a worry, like I wonder if something's going on. Like you don't want to jump to conclusions, but trust the instincts enough to at least pay attention and to try and and try and like be like conscious of the fact that sometimes even the people who look the happiest can be struggling, can deeply be struggling with these types of thoughts. <clears throat> I waited for someone, God or whoever else, to send a sign just for me. I'd wrap my arms around my knees and sit, telling myself maybe today would be the day. Maybe today the clouds would part for a ray of light and the voice from above would say, Come, it's time. I would stare closely at the tra trains barreling past the station, wondering if the sign might flash past in the window of a carriage. But instead, I just sat by myself on the roof. No matter how long and patiently I waited, I never saw any signals. Nobody whispered the words in my ear. In the end, I was all alone, just like I was everywhere else. Even every place was the same to me. It was the corner of my room where I'd been beaten terribly. It was deep at the bottom of the sea where no light could reach me. I was at the end of the world, surrounded on all sides by silent walls of stone. God must have been busy with something else. Otherwise, why wouldn't he fly over to me and speak the words? One day, when I went to the rooftop as usual, I found a girl who had just, in that very moment, crossed over the fence. She was standing boldly on the very edge of the building, staring straight ahead. And when I saw her, one powerful thought filled my mind. That's not fair. After all my anguished internal debating, all my suffering, all my waiting, I couldn't get myself over the fence. Why did this girl get to make it look so easy? That girl was going to kill herself. She was going to leap off the roof, fall into the concrete below, and end her life. It was obvious enough from the way she stood there, straddling the border between roof and sky, arms outstretched like wings to catch the wind. It seemed almost to be enjoying herself. It wasn't the sort of pose you could make if you cared about your own life. Anyway, it wasn't fair. Why did she get to die when I had to live? I didn't have the first idea who she was, but it was, just wasn't fair. Yeah, what a terrible collision of, of mindsets. I was trying to shout as loudly as I could, but what came out of my mouth was a weak, spiritless sound, like the ra rasping of a broken-down old accordion. It probably didn't help I wasn't used to conversation, but my voice just wasn't coming out right. The girl quietly stared down at the ground far below, not even noticing my presence behind her. She seemed to be looking for the exact moment to jump. Maybe God had already given her the signal. I called out again and again, but she didn't seem to hear. Maybe I no longer even existed in this world. Maybe I had slipped into some alternate plane of existence long ago and was just peeking into this world through the interdimensional one-way mirror. She ignored me so completely that it seemed possible. I called out to her, my voice choked with tears, but even then she didn't turn around. The girl's body went into a spasm of shock. She looked like a wild animal with its fur standing on end. And then, at long last, she timidly turned around to face me. Uh, 
ていうかいつからいたのずるい<笑>死ぬとかずるいずるいえど,どういうこと This is gonna be a very bizarre conversation. My tear stained face must have been a real sight. The girl lifted herself over the fence and returned to this side. She was wearing the same uniform as me, unsurprisingly. She was clearly from my school. Weird. So this is the girl. Interesting. She handed me her handkerchief and I dried my tears. Nothing like that had ever happened to me before. It was embarrassing, but it made me sort of happy. I didn't really know what to do next. The, uh, that was kind of a hard question, actually. I didn't just want, to, want her to die. I, I, I just didn't want her to die. And it's not like I was about to lecture her on treasuring her life or anything. I was just scared at the thought of someone escaping this world while I was still hesitating on the edge. What a depressing... Ah, that's just depressing, man. Good grief. <laughs> <laughs> the girl watched me as if observing of some rare species of animal. Didn't have the first idea where to begin or how to explain myself, so after thinking it over for quite some time, I chose the simple option. <laughs> That's a great reaction. It's like, serious? <laughs> like, after after this? What? Shikamo sore dake? Hori? Sore wo yutame dake ni? So Screwed up after all, huh? Guess I can't even imagine a normal conversation anymore. The thought made me genuinely sad. I couldn't find my usual numb indifference. Felt like a harsh reminder that I didn't belong in the world any longer. Watching as I slumped my shoulders dejectedly, the girl burst into laughter. And although I didn't have any real evidence either way, I didn't feel like she was mocking me. It was relieved, happy laughter. Sort of laughter I hadn't heard in a long time. <laughs> I wasn't sure what to do, so I just stood there quietly and she laughed and laughed. But no matter how patiently I waited, she just wouldn't stop. Much the opposite. After a while, she threw herself down on the ground and began to roll around, her roars of amusement even louder than before. <laughs> Watching her roll around like that started to get me in a kind of silly mood myself. The moment I noticed a little giggle slipped out of my mouth, the dam seemed to break and I... But again, laughing so loud, I surprised myself. <laughs> Such an interesting interaction. The two of us laughed for a very, very long time. Long enough that the color of the sky began to change above us. Long enough that I could almost believe the whole se se season had passed by. How were they allowed to be on the roof this long without anyone like coming up and checking on like what was going on? When her laughter finally came to an end, the girl rose shakily to her feet, both hands clutching her belly. She opened her mouth to speak, but at first she could only match a few high-pitched little giggles. Ah, <sighs> Shinuki. So that was it after all. The girl had been planning to die. I knew that much from the start, but when she came out and said it so bluntly, I was still slightly taken aback. I didn't deserve to be thanked by anyone. Why was she saying this to me? What, what is this? What's happening here? She, I, I'm confused. She's confused. Mitchu's confused. We're just all just flabbergasted at this point. The girl wrapped her hand around my neck and drew me close. After a brief petting my head, she hugged me tightly against her. 
でもそういう子嫌いじゃないぞとか言ったりしてな Her chest had a sweet, milky odor. Never smelled another girl's body like this before. I didn't know what to do. About anything, really. It was all too much. My mind just couldn't keep up. So, that's it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to Now that we have two people who like can maybe find like a joy and a reason to be with each other, but it's also kind of like scary to have two people who are, you know, for whatever reason brought to the brink to then be friends and kind of relying on each other. It's almost like,、uh, it's like setting dominoes. It's like they could be the greatest strength and pillars for each other, but one wrong tip and it feels like they both come down. え親友よろしくね、親友。よ、よろしくお願いします。Oh my gosh. I'd convinced myself there was no place for me in this world, but when I felt that life pulsing in her chest, I found myself able to breathe easy again. She smiled sweet, her body was soft and warm. I couldn't remember the last time I'd been so close to another person. Contact with other people had always seemed so scary, and it was really scary, to be honest. But at the same time, how could I put the. How can I put this? More than anything else, it felt like someone was gently tickling my heart. I returned home that day feeling as if I'd been reborn. Probably because of my unusually cheerful expression, my parents struck up a conversation with me for the first time in a while. I wasn't able to explain very well, but I did tell them I'd gotten to know somebody at school. I didn't say I made a friend, let alone best friend. After all, there was still a chance it'd all been a delusion on my part. Maybe tomorrow everything would be right back the way it was. That would be way too sad, right? Better not get my hopes up. My parents said, I see, good for you. Mixed emotions on their faces. Not that it bothered me much. That night I ate my dinner si- slightly earlier than usual, slipped into bed slightly before my normal time. For once, I actually wanted tomorrow to arrive a little faster. But in school the next day, I found everything the same. It wasn't like I had changed after all, it was still just myself. Nobody in my class even tried to talk to me. That morning, I thought I might, I might be able to keep a bit of a smile on my face, but in the end, my expression was gloomier than ever. Maybe that girl I met the day before was a sign from God, a little cosmic meddling to keep me from killing myself at the wrong time. Could have just said so from the start then. I nearly misunderstood. Nearly thought I'd found some place I belonged. Nearly thought it was okay for me to live. Never started thinking like a normal person. That was a close one. I almost forgot what my tutors had taught me so thoroughly. I hate this. Yeah, that, 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 had, that had to be it. I didn't have a best friend. That was all a dream. Ah, dreams aren't worth it, are they? You end up feeling really tired when you wake up. This feels like the pattern, too, of like with, 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 uh, with, with the cat, Romelu, and with like Yuji. She's like, dreams that she's terrified that she'll have to wake up from. After school, I stood for my seat before anyone else and blind for the exit. For now, I just wanted to get out of that place, but the rooftop had been fright- become frightening, so I couldn't go back there. I wanted to run away, but I couldn't figure out where to go. All I knew was I didn't want to be where I was. When I slid open the door and dashed out into the hallway, there was a harsh thump, and everything went black for a moment. In my haste, I'd run headlong into someone. Oh, I'm sorry. Somehow, squeezing out the words, I turned to run, but before I could take another step, someone firmly seized me by the back of my uniform. I reflexively dropped my bag and shielded my head against the blow that would follow. This was a deeply ingrained habit from my childhood. When the tutors hit my head strongly, the nausea and dizziness would sometimes last for hours. If nothing else, I wanted to avoid that. But the violence I feared didn't arrive. On the contrary, my captor bent down and picked up the bag I threw onto the ground. There she is. <sighs> <laughs> it was the first time in a while someone had bothered to call me that. Silly thought flash, flashed in my head. Oh, so that's what my name sounds like. Oh, man. <laughs> in front of my eyes was the girl from my dream. I was definitely awake, but somehow I was dreaming. 
この後何か用事でもあるの I couldn't get myself to speak properly, so I shook my head vigorously from left to right. No, nothing at all. And I kept right on doing it until at last the girl reached out and caught my cheek in her hands and told, told me still. I got the, I got the. So let's go. Let's go. She led me by the hand, and for the first time in my life, I entered a so called fast food restaurant. Complicated menu and colorful photographs left me lightheaded. I didn't have the first idea how to order. After stewing in confusion and panic for a long while, I tugged on her sleeve. I quietly nodded my head. She just watched for me for a moment, then laughed in amusement. A little later, a small tray sat, uh, uh, sat, sat on our surprisingly cramped little table, bearing the hamburger and fries the girl ordered for me. I felt like she was really close. Eating a meal with my face so near to someone else's made me kind of nervous. I feel my stomach churning. What was I gonna do if I threw up? Yeah, welcome to fast food. Hamburger? <laughs> 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 そうだ。あなたクラスメートに何て呼ばれてるか知ってる私、何か言われてるの。そう、言われてる。しかも悪口。幽霊って呼ばれてんの。笑,笑っちゃうでしょなんでよって思ったから。そんなこと言うのよしなさいって言っといたわよ。Aww, good grief, it's wholesome now. She chatted happily on, swinging a fry back and forth. I had no idea how to respond. I mean, I was surprised to know they bothered to badmouth me, but I was even more shocked she told them to stop. Why was this person being so nice to me? Just being plunged into reality after being like absent for so long. She's like, what the? What? What am I supposed to do with this? She's like, oh gosh. I got that. So, I'm going to see you. 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 I picked up the miserably flat little hamburger from its bed of wrapping paper and took a large bite. To my surprise, a strong and vibrant flavor instantly filled my mouth. Might not have looked like anything like the photo, but it actually tasted really good. Welcome to American food. Mm-hmm. Mm? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Eh? Eh? それは大げさでしょう。<笑>ゾウさんも大喜びだな、こりゃ。The hamburger was warm. The girl in front of me was kind, and I couldn't stop crying. Not surprisingly, she looked a little astounded, but even, even though she laughed, no matter what I did, she'd laugh. After that, she started coming by every day at school, inviting me along all sorts of different places. Okay, I also want to say, like, just a quick side note. Remember what I said before, like, like appearances aren't everything about someone who's having, like, self-harm plots? She's, this girl, which we still don't have the name of, is a perfect example. Like, on her appearances, she seems like a normal student. She's laughing at stuff. She's, like, really easy, like, sociable. Like, she's very kind, very, like, like a sweet, and she's willing to, like, speak to people. Like, I bet you... Most of her classmates, if you were ever to, like, if ever came to light that she had, like, been on the roof about ready to go, like, they all would have been, like, flabbergasted and shocked because, like, these types of things don't take the same form. There's not, like, some set type or person or personality. And, like, it's actually very detrimental that we, in a lot of media, paint, like, certain types of behaviors, attitudes, and personalities to be more likely to be on this, like, type of mental space. Because it's not ubiquitous and it's not linked. In fact, there's even like a skew for it being a male thing. Males are often,、uh, can often be more likely to have these types of like, like thoughts and like actually following through with it too. It's terrifying and it's something we all should be more like conscious of. It's interesting because like I also know because I haven't misread a lot of the words in this. YouTube's really gonna hate this episode, probably gonna suppress it because it's some very. 
difficult topics, but it, like it, it, it means that I need to flag it for certain types of content. Um, I might even put like a little like heads up at the beginning of the video just to make sure like because the thing is like when people when if you are in a delicate mental space like even talking about it can become like it can be bad it can be it can it can invite those and entice those thoughts to be more prominent and that's dangerous for some people and that's the thing is like we don't i don't want anybody to feel like they've like that's their only recourse their only option and that's what this story, I think, is going to try and paint the picture of. But it doesn't mean that you're going to see the messaging perfectly. Because we're all different. We see through different lenses. We see through different, like, aspects and personalities and points of view. So just a really got to say, just before we keep moving on, just, like, if you're ever struggling with these types of thoughts, like, first of all, you're not weird. It's a very common thing. I think a lot of us at one point or another have at least contemplated the thoughts before. Like, they've been around or bounced around in our head. For a lot of us, it's pretty easy to dismiss them as, you know, like one of those just irrational little blips, but not everybody. I feel like there are always, there's value that everyone has. I would be sad if anybody were to decide to take that ultimate choice. And that uh, even when things are hard and we've been through a lot of very painful things, it's still like... I think the beauty of the world and existence is the fact that like despite all the cruelty and unfairness and just just awful things that are out there there's still some things that are just unobtainably unabashedly undeniably beautiful and hopeful and worth fighting for and that includes you whoever you are whoever's watching this whoever's listening to this you might not feel like i can see you and i really can't in a realistic sense but know that like I genuinely do think that anybody who's out there who could possibly be listening or watching this absolutely has value because you can think, you can dream. Do you realize how impressive and crazy that is? All the animals in the world can't think and dream like you can. Most of the people in the world can't think or dream like you can. And the few that can? I'm sure would be very excited to meet up with you and share your like-minded passions and experiences and interests. Sometimes the greatest things that have been brought into the world that we treasure the most have been brought into the world by people who felt like they were the most worthless. Um, I'm not a fan of, of the books, but Ernest Hemingway has had an impact and brought so much joy to people's lives, despite the fact that he felt as a, he felt like a failure and inevitably felt like he t taking like like taking a way out. Which is so sad because there was so much more he could have given the world and i know a lot of people were really sad by his choice or um van gogh probably my favorite artist of all time i love his works and his art and the beautiful vision in which he saw the world and yet he was a very troubled individual who really struggled with finding his own identity and self-comfort and peace i feel like there's so much value in the life of people, despite the fact that they might not always be able to see it themselves. And um, the worst thing about it is that you're not fighting with an individual. You're not being a, fighting an abuser. You're not fighting like circumstances. You're unfortunately fighting yourself and you know all your own weakest points. You know exactly where to punch yourself to get the most damage in. You know exactly where pressure is building and how to, to really go after it. So unfortunately, we're our own worst enemies most of the time, but understand that like, it's okay to feel those things, but it's also important to recognize that there's a value that you bring to the world that's worth it. I don't care where you are, and I don't care if you feel like this message is needing for you or not, and I don't want to be preachy. I'm just saying what I wish I could have said to the friends I have lost to this, and what I wish I could have said to myself in my darkest hours. And what I wish I could say to anybody who's in anywhere close to those places that I've experienced and seen people experience. You're worth it. You're worth sticking around. It's worth having you in the world. It's worth letting you be able to be here. And I don't think that's ever going to change. So, for what it's worth, there it is. I guess you must have found me completely clueless, kind of, my cluelessness kind of entertaining. One day it was karaoke, the next was arcade, the next day it was something else entirely. I got to see a lot of new places and experienced a lot of new things. She laughed when I asked that question too. More than anything else, she was a girl who laughed a lot. And that place I went with her was always glittering with vivid rainbows of light. 
When I went back home after we said goodbye, my room looked stale and dismal by comparison. It was like falling into a broken down monochrome world. More and more, I spent my time impatiently counting down the hours until our next outing, wishing she'd swoop down and take me out of there. I remember getting off the train with her at some station I'd never visited before and buying matching pencil boxes in a store I'd never known existed. After anguishing over my choice for dozens of minutes, I brought her a small hairpin as a present and got a pouch in return. We traded hair scrunchies, ate ice cream together. The days rolled by like one unbroken dream. Her email address and phone number were recorded on my cell phone. I was too scared to send her a message or dial her number, but for some reason just looking at those characters on the screen would bring a smile to my face. Aww. One day, the two of us were on the rooftop after school, gazing leisurely, uh, leisurely at the setting sun. The girl spoke to me in a quiet voice as the wind blew her through her hair. She was always smiling, so I was taken aback to see her look so serious all of a sudden, and more importantly, that completely unexpected question left me thoroughly flustered. I mean, that's one of those things where, like, I don't think an, any person that wasn't in similar place could ever respond like that. <笑>そりゃそうだね。飛び降りの理由なんてそれしかないもんね。ミチルは本当に変な子だ。そうかな。そんなことないけど。私はね、いろいろな人にいろいろなことを聞かれるんだ。進路がどう、彼氏がどう
Pulled me up from the bottom of the sea, should I return the favor, take her hand like she did for me? The question tormented me for a very long time. But there was no way I could do what she'd done. I, still, I was still a piece of trash, and it was only thanks to her that I could laugh a little. It was only thanks to her I had found a little happiness. I couldn't allow myself to misunderstand. This was a temporary world, a dream I'd wake up from eventually. Lingering alone on the roof, I gripped the cold metal handrail tightly. I still didn't have the courage to make the short journey to the other side of that fence. In that respect, too, she was an amazing person. She had so much that I didn't, even the courage to end her own life. For a few days after answering that phone call, she didn't attend school. I was consumed by the fear something bad had happened to her, just like when I was a child, and knelt by my windowsill and whispered countless prayers. Uh, but she didn't even consider, like, calling her. At school, I would hesitate in my classroom at the end of the day, thinking she might appear in the doorway, like always, to drag me off to play. But I was a ghost in that class. I didn't dare make myself conspicuous. I reluctantly trudged up to the roof and waited for her, but no matter how patiently I waited, she never came. There was nothing but the steady passage of time. I did nothing but draw breath in a monochrome world. One day, somebody called my cell phone from a withheld number. I was scared to pick it up, but thinking it might just be her, I gathered up all my courage I could muster and pressed the answer button. Mosh, mosh. On the other side of the line, I heard someone breathing harshly, as if in pain. Maybe it was nothing more than a random prank call from a stranger. But in my mind's eye, I saw her on the other end, the person I cared about more than anyone else in the world. And I remembered her words on the roof that day. Back then, I wasn't able to give her a proper response. I'd left so many things unsaid, I decided to convey those feelings to whoever this might be. それなのにどうして一人でどこかに行こうとするの。あなたは置いて行かれるのがどんなに辛いか分かってないんだ。だからかってにどこかに行こうとしちゃうんだ。わお。失うことは当たり前だよ。誰かに嫌われることだって特別
あれってその通りなんだまったくバカだと思うよ<笑>笑っていいよ In the classroom, my friends had become the subject of rumors. My classmates said that she'd gone to know a man decades older than her over the internet, a man with a wife and children. They said he treated her like his mistress. He said something about photos of her and the man getting, a, uh, uh, and the man getting scattered around the internet by him making her have sex with other men. Fetch me. Good freaking grief. It's like, I'm glad that this is a bit more on topic. It's like, it's just what it is. It's like, it's trafficking. That's what it became. Pre a predator, it's a, 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 being a, pre a predator who then used, like, that influence of being older, having resources, and the, the, the pictures and everything, and just turned her into it and trafficked her. One morning, there had been a naked photo of her taped on top, on top of my desk. I silently tore it off, shoved the paper into a trash can, and immediately left the classroom, slamming the door behind me as loudly as I could. But none of it mattered to me. No matter what sort of things she'd done, I didn't change, change, it didn't change the fact that she was my best friend. That's the thing. Again, she's like... She feels so poorly about herself, she doesn't realize what she means to meet you, what she really means. そんなことないもん。私、学校で嫌われてるんだ。友達もいないの。でもね、誰も相手にしてくれないから、あなたと友達になったわけじゃないからね。あなたのことがいいなって思ったから、友達になったんだからね。それだけは本当。でも信じて
I wanted to her to know, but I couldn't speak or move. My body felt like it was a, encased in concrete. I couldn't lift a single finger. Sayonara. Michire. Touch. I wanted to say the words were best friends, aren't we? Let's die together. But instead, I just watched her in silence like a complete idiot. See? I was right. I'm the stupidest one after all. I didn't know what to do, I just cowered, and then I tried to scramble over the rail to see her, to see the end. But I couldn't do it, no matter what, I couldn't get myself over that fence. <laughs> I could feel my feet giving way underneath me, and I couldn't keep myself upright. Why hadn't I died with her? I was right, it was right from the start. There was never a place for me here. Screwed up in a big this time, didn't I? Shouldn't have left myself think I could become a normal person. Shouldn't have thought I could find something like happiness. In the end, it vanished. The bubble pops, the case. In that case, it would have been better never to have gotten my hopes up in the first place. Just like my parents stopped expecting anything from me, I should have stopped expecting anything from the world. I heard the wail of a siren and a chorus of horrified screams from far away. Then I fainted. My body still twi twi uh, twined awkwardly around that fence. Just before I lost consciousness, I heard the sound like a click of a television set falling silent. I don't know if it was a hallucination or not, but I heard it clearly. When I woke up, I was lying in a hospital bed. It seemed I'd, it seemed I'd been unconscious for quite a long time. Normally, there should have been police waiting at my bed to question me, but Dad took care of all that. Probably less out of concern for me out of his desire to keep this troublesome situation from dragging on. I thought they'd discharge me soon enough, but I discovered my chronic chest pain had grown dramatically more intense. My body was no longer physically capable of enduring a normal life. The doctor said the shock of losing a close friend may well have advanced the progression of the disease, but I didn't really know if that was true. Either way, the pain in my heart was now so agonizing it could at times render me unconscious. Fetch me. My parents had more or less abandoned me, but I guess this miserable new development managed to make them move them to pity. They decided to send me to America for a heart transplant operation. Personally, I wouldn't have minded just dying, but it seemed like those two wanted to feel like caring parents, so I decided I might as well go along with it. Things moved along behind my back. Large amounts of money traded hands, although I didn't know the details. They didn't tell me much of anything about the donor, and I wasn't particularly interested either. All they said was I'd be receiving the heart of a brain-dead girl of the same age as me. I'm sure it must have been a really big, complicated operation, but since that day on the rooftop, I'd been li living like an empty husk. Can't really say it felt like much of an ordeal. <sighs> they carried me off in an airplane to a place where I couldn't understand a word anyone was saying. The doctor put me under anesthesia and I fell asleep. Before I knew it, I was right back in Japan. It really did seem like it happened in the blink of an eye. Didn't have time to feel much of anything. Our procedure apparently went about as smoothly as possible. They'd pumped me full of immunosuppressants to prevent my body from rejecting the new heart, but I recovered without any of the sicknesses that often result from the side effects. My reaction to this news was indifferent at best. It didn't even feel particularly strange having another person's organ inside my body. Sometimes I almost doubted whether they'd really operated on me. Of course, just touching the scar on my chest was enough to convince myself it had been true, but really, what difference did it make either way? The lump of flesh inside me constantly thumping away was different from the one that had been in there yesterday. That was all. Nobody was going to care. Nothing important had changed. My doctor celebrated my remarkable recovery from the surgery as a miracle. So enthusiastic, you might have thought my good fortune was his own. My parents had relieved expressions on their faces as well, expressions that seemed to read, now we won't have to worry ourselves about the girl anymore. The many months I spent in various hospitals came to an end and I began to recuperate at home. That was when the first signs of the change began to appear. Apparently, I was saying uncharacteristic things to my parents. I was talking and behaving in ways I usually wouldn't, almost as if I'd become a completely different person. Oh, interesting. So, the other Michiru came with the heart. Okay. I wonder if they're going to try... Because, like... They, they're, like, for a while they've talked about this idea that, like, inheriting an organ and people feeling like they have, like, memories and feelings or even, like, tastes from the other person. Like, 
someone who can't stand spicy food getting an operation uh, where they get a new organ, like a liver transplant or a bone marrow transplant or something. And then afterwards, they're obsessed with spicy food. And it turns out that the donor enjoyed spicy food. Like a lot of really interesting coincidences like that. Whether there's validity to it or not, doesn't really matter in the case of a story. So what if in this case, they're saying like, what if the person, the personality kind of carried over? Interesting. Because remember, like, Dark Mewtwo talked about how she, like, she's like, I believe 100%, like, in an afterlife. I'm an example of it. So she was brain dead. She died and then kind of woke up in Mewtwo's body, but sharing it with the, heads, the hair studies with Mewtwo. That's really interesting. My parents were incredulous at first, half suspecting some kind of elaborate prank, but as they knew, it wasn't exactly a practical joke by nature. I wasn't consciously aware of any of this. My alternative personality came to the price of gaps in my memory. Maybe I was sleepwalking? Turning into a different person without even realizing it? The doctor diligently studied my brain activity and asked me all sorts of questions, but in the end he could only offer a vague conclusion. This phenomena can't be explained by modern medicine. Oh yeah, that's helpful. I love it when you get that excuse. I've actually had that excuse. It's frustrating. <laughs> Ultimately, the, the adults decided that my powerful psychological impact of losing my friend in front of my eyes had led to changes in my personality. But again, I didn't really care either way. I responded with my usual, oh, that's so. The gaps in my memory became frequent, and as time passed, they grew large, longer, harder to ignore. The other me, showed up in these chunks of lost time, seemed surprisingly competent. From what I gathered, she was much more sociable than I was, a lot better at schoolwork as well. One night, I noticed dinner was a little extravagant. Dad smiled across the table and told me it was a reward for trying so hard at my student's studies lately. It was kind of a strange exp experience, but I didn't really mind. I mean, if things were going smoothly, who cared if I didn't remember doing the things that was being praised for it or not? God, oh, like, how destructive that turned. As this pattern continued, I found myself acquiring a number of friends as well. Of course, I'd gotten to know them during the blank spaces in my memory, so I didn't really know what sort of people they were. Without any effort on my part, lots of people began greeting me in a friendly tone on the road to school. After saying hi, they'd usually ask, what's wrong? Not feeling so good today? Seems like they saw the usual me as a sick Michiru, and the person who showed up in the, those blank periods of lost time as the normal, cheerful Michiru. Interesting. So it's the reverse of what we've experienced. <gasps> no. Wait a minute. Oh my gosh, I was wrong! So is Dark Michidu the real one? Dark Michidu being like very monotone, very stoic. Oh, but but the studies are better. I don't know. It's weird. That would be really interesting, but like that doesn't quite line up now that I think about it thoroughly. But like the idea of like the like the like the very monotone, very unemotional Michidu being like this one that feels like they don't have any purpose of existing. But they're the one that remember everything, that have been stepping in and changing things, right? So, that still tracks with being Dark Michidu. But, like, when did Michidu become what we see of Michidu today? Because, like, the way she's describing, this, the, like, in this time period, Dark Michidu is the happy, perky Michidu. Which could have been an act, for sure, but, like, I'm guessing that, that Light Michidu was so depressed at this time in her life that even Dark Michidu seemed cheerful, comparatively. I was lying down in my room one evening when Dad stopped by to check up on me. Not knowing what else to do, I forced a strange smile onto my face. Oof. Boy, that, that comes across a whole different with a whole different meaning. Smiling, Dad left the room and closed the door behind him. And all of a sudden, an image flashed into my head. An image of a girl frozen in flight. It was the girl who'd left me so abruptly, my best friend who'd abandoned this world. Her final goodbye echoed in my head, rebounding off the walls of my skull. The word was terribly sharp. Every time it clanged against the bone, it felt as though someone was drilling me open from the inside. Trembling with fear and pain, I drove into my bed in search of refuge. Greasy sweat broke out of my forehead. 
I swallowed a handful of sleeping pills my doctor had prescribed, pulling the blanket over my head and squeezing my eyes shut. There's that tranquilizer. If I can get past this, I'll become the cheerful Michiru again. I can't break down now. I silently repeat those words to myself. And soon enough, the drowsiness wrapped me up like a thick, sticky cocoon, blanket and all. Finally, I'll be able to sleep. I'll, put the, I'll pull through this after all. It was just as those thoughts were running hazily through my mind, just as I stood on the border between reality and dreams when I heard an unfamiliar voice from outside my blanket. Hmm. I didn't understand in the slightest how this was supposed to be alright, hearing the voice of some strange woman as I tried to fall asleep re re really didn't seem to qualify. So this implies that when she's in her, like, entering a dream state, she has a brief bridge point where she might be able to contact the other personality. That's an opening we can probably use. The instant I heard those words, I felt my heart pound violently. A sharp, white-hot pain spread through my chest, through my entire body, as if traveling through my blood vessels. I remembered the doctor offhandedly mentioning a phenomenon known as cellular memory. A rare to cases, patients receiving heart transplants had seemed to inherit aspects of previous owners' tastes or memories. Yeah, this is a documented thing, but it's inconsistent. There's no proof of it, but it's happened more uh, often enough that there seems to be some credence to it. It's really interesting. He didn't seem to believe in the idea, but maybe it was real. Maybe that happened to me. No, this wasn't anything so minor. The former owner's per entire personality had slipped inside me, complete and distinct from my own, and now she was talking to me, declaring herself my best friend. I wasn't about to put up with that. Another best friend was the last thing I wanted. <laughs> Throwing off the covers, my pulse pounding in fear of my own body, I shouted at the disembodied voice. <laughs> Couldn't even tell if this was reality or some insane nightmare. My terror escalated into frenzy. I ripped out clumps of my own hair. I bit my arms. I kicked things all over the room until my feet bled. But it wasn't enough. I grabbed a box cutter from my desk, grasping it tightly in my hands and listening carefully, tried to figure out where the voice was coming from. That's terrifying. The voice was the cause of this pain. It flowed through my body with the blood thumping out of my heart, bringing agony with it. I had to get that voice out of my body. I had to, or I was going to go crazy. With that thought, I cut my, uh, my wrist with the blade, trying to drain the voice out of me along with my blood, but no matter how my arm bled, the voice remained securely inside my body. In that case, I had no choice. I needed to uproot it directly. I needed to get rid of that foreign entity pul pulsing away inside me. Oh my gosh. I pointed the blade at my own chest and stabbed as hard as I could. It wasn't the sharpest blade, but it broke the skin easily enough. Slowly, it gouged its way through my flesh. Just a little further, and it reached the heart. The evasion would be over soon. Have you rid of the voice? I felt relief wash over me, but just then I smelled that distinctive mixture of cigarettes and strange women and realized my father had entered the room. Before I knew it, my room had been a disaster scene. The shattered and torn remnants of my belongings stained dark red with splashes of flesh blood. The box cutter fell from my hand and hit the ground with a dull thunk. The sound abruptly brought me back to reality. Dad's familiar face was contorted so he looked like an entirely different person. I had to smile. I had to reassure him. Oh, that would have been horrifying. But different words came out of my mouth. Hey, Papa. I... Dad hugged me closely for the first time in many years, but it was very different from the girl's embrace. Even though he was holding me close, I could feel a vast chasm looming between us. That very night, I was admitted to a new hospital. Not that I had any choice in the matter. It was the kind of building that has iron bars on every window, and even though you could only crack them open a few centimeters anyway. Yep, yep. It was very quiet there. All the patients were tranquil and sedated. Sometimes I felt as though I'd wandered to some forgotten corner of the afterlife. They told me that people suffering from illnesses of the mind were gathered here, but I never saw anyone thrash around violently or scream and rant at phantoms. Everyone had con constant, vaguely dopey little smiles on their faces. For the most part, they passed the days quietly watching television.
There were times when I found those con- constant, unchanging smiles frightening, but I got the idea soon enough. Basically, I was in a place where you could live without getting tangled up in your emotions. You could pass the time peacefully, only thinking about pleasant things. <clears throat> to put the opposite spin on it, in that place, you weren't allowed to think or have anything else. When they let us outside for a walk, the mental shackles that usually bound my legs were removed. In exchange, they looped a rope around our waist. All the patients were tied together on that one length of rope, like children pretending to be a train, even though we were all grown up now. I always thought that was kind of silly. The medicine they gave me there made my mind feel pleasantly clear. The other personality didn't emerge, and that airy voice didn't crawl through my veins like a swarm of insects. It was like living inside a tightly closed music box. Boring, but very peaceful. I stayed there for a long time. Didn't talk with anyone. For the most part, I just stood quietly by the wall, trying not to stand out, trying to shrink myself down to the point where the world would overlook me. But one day, I caught my chains on the leg of the chair and tripped to the ground. That had never happened before, so I wasn't sure what to do. Fortunately, no one insulted me or yelled angrily. Instead, a few patients nearby put their hands on their mouths and giggled softly in amusement. I liked hearing that sound, and lying there on the ground, the idea occurred to me. Maybe if I fell on purpose, I could make people laugh again. The next day, I tripped again, and again people who noticed laughed a little. The day after that, I deliberately spilled a glass of water, and once more I heard the pleasant sound of laughter. Emboldened by my success, I spoke. More people laughed than before. Their voices were warm and gentle. I'd found a way to make myself useful by devoting myself to clowning around. I could at least make others smile. Oh, fetch me. From that day on, I acted out sillier version of myself, an exaggerated, funny caricature of me, and I sustained myself on a sugary sweet diet of laughter. Alright then, from now on, I'll go with this way of life, pretending it didn't bother me. It was worth it to do something for other people. It was worth it to have something to live for. Oh my gosh, and that's where Sundere comes from. Nobody had appreciated me before this. I wanted them to like the real me. Problem was, the real me wasn't any good, so I might as well just pretend. Oh my gosh, didn't I call that? I called that from like the beginning when she was like the Sundere. I was like, I feel like I said, I think I said something along the lines of like, she's being a Sundere because she's terrified or ashamed or, or, or just, just hates the real her and it's exactly what's happened but like how we got here was just a trek through the hells like holy crap all i had to do was act in the most convenient role force that most convenient emotion become someone who was a smile put a smile on people's faces even if that meant the real me disappeared entirely i didn't care i was a little anxious about whether someone as stupid as me could even act convincingly but i had no choice but to try among the patients, I gained a niche as the weird but funny girl. As I grew into the role, I became more lively, and in time, the doctors decided I was on my way to a full recovery and politely ejected me from the hospital. I'd lost my place in the world, but my parents soon found me another. Apparently, they'd heard somewhere about this special school that only gathered students with complicated circumstances. I was enrolled in uh, Mahami... Mahama Academy. Mihama. I'm like, why am I saying so wrong? Mihama Academy as soon as my after my return. I kept right on playing the clown in this school. Thought it would be nice to keep everyone laughing, and in fact, that's just how things turned out. The days rolled past pleasantly enough for the most part. But every once in a while, I'd abruptly remember that this, was too, this too was nothing but an artificial make-believe world, where everyone laughed together. I wasn't smiling from the heart, and over time, my uncertainty grew. I didn't want to lose what I'd found here, but I didn't want to grow dependent on it. The more I pretended to be someone I wasn't, the less I understood what I wanted to do. Did I? Did an imposter like me really belong here in the first place? Oh my gosh, she was calling herself an imposter way early on. And I just brushed it off saying like, that's just, you know, her facade because she's scared of who the real per- her is. Frankly, I don't think she knows who her real self is. And I don't even know if we could identify who the real her is anymore either. I wonder where her real core is. How much of it did we see when we did the pretend dating? Or was it all wrapped up in so much falsity, falsity that like they're like it's hard to pull out what was real in that? Because that was that's a tangle and a half. That's a massive like nest of just complication. <laughs> So where do you find the truth in that? How do you find the nugget at the core? And then if we find it. Is that gonna? Is she will she be able to accept it, or will she spiral right back into those dangerous places that put her on the brink? Like obviously, it'd be far better for her if we could find that core, help her understand that there is something valuable there, that she's genuinely worthwhile because she absolutely is. 
but like you can't just tell people that and have them believe it. I mean, it helps. It helps to show people that appreciation, that genuine love and care and affection. But there's only so much you can do. I felt like I was living in an, anti an antlion pit. There was nowhere else for me to go, no way out of the rut. All I could do was struggle not to fail, fall. We're not going to go much longer, but I need to hear this response. Having delivered her lengthy story in one under uninterrupted sitting, Michiru finally pauses, her face lined with fatigue. And how do you even respond to that? Fetch <sighs> Scratching my head, I search for the words Michiru needs to hear. They prove surprisingly easy to find. What you need right now isn't this, it isn't this fatalistic pessimism. It's medical treatment. A visit to the hospital would be a good start. Your problem's too complicated to face on your own. For now, let the professionals figure it out, and after they found the cause, work slowly and surely towards getting better. I think I understand the general outline of the situation. The memories of her organ donor have influenced Michiru's mind, or so she thinks at least. Not exactly a common phenomena, but apparently not entirely unprecedented. Whatever the case may be, whether the girl needs appropriate treatment in an appropriate setting. Also, uh, I don't agree with you. I think she needed to hear something like, I don't know. I maybe uh, it was real to me. Like I have feelings for you, but again, if he doesn't know that, like it would be worse to say it without meaning it. So I'm not actually upset. I just wish he could say it, but I can understand him not. Mm. Yeah, I'd strongly recommend it. I doubt they'll keep you there longer than a week for an examination like this, and I'm worried about you. No, I think he does. Please, say you do. Why would I lie? I didn't dislike that make-believe game of yours. I probably could have found another way to kill time, but playing around with you was, well, enjoyable. I'm not lying. How many times do you want me to make want to make me say the exact same thing? Gosh, she deserves so much better than she has. I don't want you to disappear on me, Michiru. I'd find that very unpleasant. I added very, but I don't care. This is seriously the last time I'm going to repeat myself, because the time I spent with you wasn't half bad. I talk me I take Michiru by the shoulder and look her straight in the eyes. You're living in the present, Michiru. Don't let yourself get caught up in the past. You can't fix it. What's done is done what's done can't be undone, but the future's still yours to shape. Incredibly obvious, yes, but it doesn't hurt to keep that in mind. Right now your future's on the line. You need to take control of it. With that said, I kiss Michiru briefly on the lips. She turned down. Her, she, she turned down her face in embarrassment and hesitates for a moment, studying the floor as if deciding which words to pick up off the ground. That's a great way to describe that. I also love how he's like, this is real. He's not playing a pretend thing I, right now. Like, I think that was literally like, he just wanted her to like, know something like that, that this was a real moment. In the end, she chooses the extremely simple words, simple ones. Extremely simple, but not half bad. A pretty respectable choice, actually. True. Leave the arrangements with the hospital to me. I'll get something worked out. I am absolutely Michiru here. Like, I... 
I... I had, like, what was it? I, I, oh, yeah. I, when I was in high school, I had a really nasty bike accident that led to, a, like, a shattering of my knee joint that needed to be, like, operated to repair. Like, I, they had to, like, bind my bone back into the right shape so that I would be able to walk again someday. It was a really exhaustive surgery. Um, I crashed in front of a car. Like, I didn't get hit by a car, but I crashed in the middle of the road. And I, like, had to pull myself out of the road. And I remember, like... I'm, my mom raced to come and find me because my friend used my phone to call her and let her know what had happened. And she was freaking out. She was scared. And I remember I looked up at her like with my like like shattered leg, right? And I looked up at her and I said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cause this problem. <laughs> like, I just say way. I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm such a nuisance. And I'm lying there like needing to like, ex like dire medical attention. And I'm apologizing for the inconvenience of getting, like, I'm making my mom dry out to come pick me up. You're not a nuisance. But if you're feeling guilty anyway, you can show me your gratitude once you're feeling better. <laughs> no, to be an idiot. そうだ。ね。できれば明日の朝早くにここを出て病院に行きたい。うん。おう、そうで、あ、だから。それだけ。5時でお願いします。Sure, <laughs> she delivers this line in such a subdued, quavery tone of voice that I can't help but laugh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got it. Alright then, I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, well, looks like I'm gonna end up indebted to choose to do yet again. Let's go ahead and end it here. That was a... That was a lot. That was a lot. Like, I, I kind of was primed for it, like, for backstory, but that was a lot. Like, this episode... I thought the previous episode was going to be the longest one. Nope, that was this one. But, like, I couldn't have stopped that halfway through. We had to get through all of that. A lot of stuff makes more sense. It's not perfect. I still feel like there's a lot more to the dark Michiru side of things that we need to see. But... We've got a lot of good, like... We've got stuff to to platform off of. And hopefully we can help figure things out. But unlike most situations in these games, I'm really, really not sure where you go with this. Like, this is definitely a play-by-ear type of situation where you just do the best things you can for for her. And then you take every day a day they take every step a day at a time. Um real life stuff can get this complicated. It's not common but it can and it's like I don't think you can just expect even someone in a cushy comfortable seat experiencing a virtual version of a type of complication like I can't sit here and pretend like I know what we need to do next I think Yuji's next step is pretty solid I think he handled that pretty well where he was able to still help her understand that he cares about her and what doesn't want her to go away but also doesn't over promise or over hype I wish he could feel comfortable just kind of like reciprocating but I also worry that if he were too forward that she would just dismiss it as a lie to placate her rather he gave a very Yuji answer and I think she can actually draw strength from the fact that he's not trying to ham things up he's not acting and pretending even if his answers aren't like like dream boat versions of like yes of course I love you with all my heart kind of a situation I feel like she can at least trust in it and that's honestly probably more important because I would say stability and like consistency will do her a lot more good than giving her perfect words just because you can say the perfect thing doesn't mean that that's the right thing and that's really interesting to think about but yeah, I'm looking forward to understanding more about Dark Michido because I think that's the next big hurdle. We have to figure out, like, what's Dark Michido's game? Like, what's her story? Where'd she come from? Why is she, like, wanting to be the best friend for Michido and fix all her problems? And when that went so terribly south for Michido, why is Dark Michido still intervening? When it's pretty clear it had a pretty strong detrimental effect on Michido herself. 
Like, Dark Michiru started becoming concerned and said she needs to go to a hospital. So, like, she's at least aware that Michiru has a history and, like, knows what could happen if Michiru gets pushed too far. But Dark Michiru still interfering like she is, is weird. Like, I understand not wanting to face Oblivion, but... I feel like it's I feel like she's it's still odd what she's doing. So I really want to know more about her and what that story is all about. But when the time comes, we'll figure it out, I'm sure. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for joining me for a very long episode. If you're still here somehow, bravo. I am so I don't deserve how awesome you are for actually sitting through this whole experience with me. It was heavy stuff. Like I said, I wouldn't be shocked if YouTube did not suppress this video. Like, it's gonna happen. So, if you not only managed to find the video, but you watched it and you're still here, like, bravo for you. Like, thank you so much. And I don't know how I can repay you for that. Hopefully, we continue to share these wonderful stories together and that you continue to show up for them because I'm gonna make them. They'll be here regardless of whether you had the time or interest or not. I just, I'm glad you're here and that there's something here that's been valuable to you up until now. And hopefully I can keep making content that you find worthwhile, that you find is worth spending some time on and sharing with me because this has been really fun. Thank you a million times. Thank you for being here. And a special, special thank you to the patrons and members, you know, for not only showing your support for me, but also believing enough in me for to, to help motivate and to to sponsor me to try and make content better, make it more often with better, like, like more, more talent, more assets, more interesting things to do. It means so much to me. And I really hope I can continue to deliver content that you can be excited to come back for. Thank you so much. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. And until the next video watching me, I'll see you next. I'll see you there.